City Church, how are you guys this morning? Woo, I don't know about you, but I was getting ready to jump out my shoes. Uh, I, I know what you're thinking. I'm not going to sing. I know we, I can't follow Pastor Ron. That was just, uh, whoo, man, Pastor Ron. Woo, man. Well, he is risen, and we celebrate that this morning. Children, um, you may be dismissed if you would head out to <clears throat> your left. My right. Head out. You'll see our children's workers back there uh, waving at you. Get ready for your, bye, baby. I love you. He went, hey, say happy Easter real quick. Happy Easter. All right. Um, that was little Leia, little lion, our, our, our youngest. Um, so, yeah, children, get ready to go to kids' church. You guys are going to have an awesome, fun-filled, action-packed time adventure there. Um, real quick, if you are new to the church or it's been a while since you've been here, go ahead and pull the uh, card out in front of you and the chair back in front of you. There's a QR code there. Go ahead and scan that and fill out the information. We'd love to meet up with you, grab some coffee. Um, also, you'll see some of us wearing these little badges. You guys will hold this just real quick, sorry. These little badges right here, these little doohickeys, these actually come with the catchphrase. So if you see one of us with one of these badges, you pull it. There's a snake in my boot. So all, all of the people who have this have a different catchphrase. Um, so Pete, I, I know Pete's, a, he's a Pillsbury Doughboy, so you want to find him because that, that's, his, that's his catchphrase. Um, also, uh, just to let you guys know, we, we do offering a little bit different at this church. We don't pass the plates. We um, have a giving station in the back. If you take this card out and you want a text to give or give online, all the information is there. Uh, if people write checks or you have cash you wanna, you'd like to donate, there's these uh, metal boxes on the wall there and then two in the back in our lobby as well. That's our um, giving center. Um, go ahead and um, do that. And then also Tuesday nights, we have our men and women's study. And then also Thursday in Galt. We're starting up our midweek in Galt. And this is such a huge day for the Galt Church. It was two years ago to the day where we... Um, found out that that church needed a new pastor and we as a church prayed and came along and um, took that church and has made it part of our Elk Grove campus as well and now we're reaching two cities but uh, so this week we're launching we're launching um, our midweek services there youth over there as well on Thursdays the red letter challenge this is an amazing um, uh, study right it's studying the lives of Jesus the words of Jesus and how to apply it to your everyday life how to live out the words of Jesus in your everyday life so that's Tuesdays at 6.30. I'm going to, every, every time I see him, I'm going to call him out. I was planning on praying, but every time I see Pastor Ron, I always try to use him in the service. This is Pastor Andrew's dad. The reason why Pastor Andrew is so cool. Um, so would you please welcome from the cowboy capital of the world, Oakdale, California, Pastor Ron Houston. Amen. Ten minutes ago, I felt like the 73-year-old man that I am. 
Right now, I feel like an 18-year-old man. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it's because Jesus is in the house. Amen. Let's look to him. All eyes on him. All eyes on Jesus. We serve a living Savior who is in this house today. You are the comeback champion of all times. For you have defeated death. You have defeated the grave. And you are alive. And you are walking in our midst today with all your resurrection power. We are grateful today, oh God. And we simply celebrate today what we know and experience 365 days a year as we walk in your resurrected life. Jesus, have your way in this house. Have your way in this house today. Touch people, Lord, who are oppressed, people who are perhaps depressed, people who are sick, people that are hopeless, people that are without life. God, come in the name of Jesus and work a miracle and work a miracle. The Bible tells us, clap your hands, all you people, and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. So would you do that? Shout unto God. Shout unto God.
in the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. There is life in the name of Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus over this place today, over every life here today, over this community. We speak the name of Jesus over the state of California, over the United States of America. God, as people are gathered all around, let there be a great harvest today in the United States of America. God, we thank you for your name that is alive today brings power today we thank you in the name of jesus in the name of jesus come on let's give him praise one more time praise the lord and you can be seated this morning and if you've got your bible you can turn with me to john chapter 11 verse 25 or you can grab your phone and punch in john 11 25 good morning, good morning. man i am excited you know why i'm excited it's easter sunday amen it's Resurrection Day, and um, not only that, but I get to share the greatest story ever told. You see, on this Easter of 2023, I get to talk to you about the one. I get to talk to you about the one who was ruthlessly beaten, but that beating didn't have the last word. I get to talk to you about the one who was nailed to the cross, but that cross could not hold him. I get to talk to you about the one who was laid in a grave, but that grave could not contain him. Amen. I get to talk to you about the one who overcame death. I get to talk to you about the one who could not and cannot be defeated. I get to talk to you about the one who walked in victory and walks in victory today. I get to talk to you about the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. I get to talk to you about the one who is in the business of bringing joy to joyless places. I get to talk to you about the one who's in the business of bringing hope to hopeless lives, life to lifeless families. Friends, his name is Jesus, amen? He is the Lamb of God. He is the risen Savior, and he is our soon coming King. Praise the Lord with me today. On Easter, I want you to know, crucifixion day, Friday was filled with loss and pain and hopelessness and death. But friends, it is Easter. <laughs> and Easter, Resurrection Day, Sunday, it is here and he brings hope and he brings healing and he brings deliverance and he brings salvation and he brings life to this place today. It was a bad day to be the devil. See, Friday, he thought he'd won. But Sunday, Jesus rose again. Amen. <laughs> And the good news is, is he came back to life, but he brings life today to you. It didn't stop then. It continues today, and his life flows into, into this place. In John chapter 11, we have a promise that was made 2,000 years ago to a lady named Martha. It's a statement that has not expired. It's a truth that remains, and it is a truth. It is a promise that is for you today. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. 
And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Will you read these last four words with me today? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I want to spend a few moments on this verse, and then I'm going to tell you a story, and then I want to pray for you today. If you look at the, word, the verse, the first four words Jesus said to her. Here Jesus is talking to Martha. Martha and her siblings, Mary and Lazarus, lived in a little town outside Jerusalem called Bethany. They were very close friends with Jesus, and their brother Lazarus had become very sick. Well, Martha, she'd seen that Jesus can heal. She believed that Jesus can heal. She'd seen it with her own eyes. So she says, well, I'm going to go get Jesus, and Jesus will come heal you. Do you know what she's really wanting to do? She's wanting to avoid tragedy. How many people here would love to avoid tragedy in your life? She wants to avoid some tragedy, so she goes and she finds Jesus, the healer. And Jesus waited. He finds her, and she finds him and tells him, and and Jesus waited two days to go, and then it took him two days to travel. Two plus two equals four. You guys are mathematicians. Come on. <laughs> <clears throat> two plus two equals four. How many of you know a lot can happen in four days? How many of you know a lot can happen in four hours? How many of you know a lot can happen in four minutes in your life? How many of you know a lot can happen in four seconds? And in those four days, Lazarus dies. You know, we read these stories, and they're cute little stories for us because we know the end of the story, but I want you to put yourself there in that moment. For some of you, it's not too hard because you've been living there. For four days, she watches her brother deteriorate. For four days, they lose hope. For four days, there's trauma and there's, there's chaos. For four days, she's waiting and checking her Apple Watch hour after hour. Where is Jesus the disappointment mounts, and, and it gets more and more hopeless, and Lazarus dies. We're told in the passage that, that many gathered at their home. It was right outside of Jerusalem. Many knew Lazarus, and they all gathered at, at their home. And, and Jesus starts walking into the house, and Mary gets word that he's, that he's close. So she goes out to meet Jesus, and she has a sole reason in meeting Jesus. She's going to confront him. Verse 21 of chapter 11 she goes up to Jesus and the nerve of her, she says, if you would have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died, Jesus. If you would have just shown up earlier, if you would have come when I told you, my brother wouldn't be dead. You were late. As if Jesus can be late. As if Jesus has a timeline that ever expires. <laughs> As if the, the window had closed on the miracle. How many of you here today, you know life can be trying, can it? Life can be hard. Things can come at you unexpectedly. Trauma, tragedy, disappointment. Our hope and a lot of our efforts are put into avoiding that. But even those who are close to Jesus face trial. Even those who walk with Jesus face problems in their, in their life. If you'd only been here four days ago, Jesus... If you'd only been here a minute ago, if you'd only been here a few seconds ago, if you'd only done fill in the blank, this wouldn't have happened. And we think his ability to intervene in our life expires. I'm going to hurt someone's feelings today, okay? I'm going to hurt your feelings. Jesus doesn't care about your timeline. He's not concerned about when you think things should happen. He's not concerned how you lay things out. Jesus is concerned with bringing the greatest glory to his father. And when he looks at your life, your life will bring the greatest glory to his father. In that moment, Jesus addresses Martha and he says these two words, I am. Everyone say, I am. I am. In the Bible, when you see these two words together, it's a statement within a statement. When Moses went before the burning bush, God ID'd himself. He said, I am who I am. It originates from the Hebrew Yahweh. The word Yahweh means to be. The one who caused all things to be. The source of everything. God says, I am who I am. And Jesus here in two words reminds Martha of something. You are not dealing with a normal person. You are not dealing with just another prophet. You're not dealing with just some healer. You are dealing with the I am. You are dealing with the source of all things. Something, nothing is out of my control. I am the source. I am the creator. Friends, 
There's nothing about your life that intimidates Jesus. There's nothing about what you go through that is beyond him, that is too much for him. You're sitting here, you're racking your brain with all the things from your life, and, and I want you to hear me today. Your life circumstances don't match, they aren't a match to him. They're not a match to the power he brings to the table. He says, I am the resurrection. Do you know what that means? For something to be resurrected, it must first die. There was death. If Lazarus hadn't died, there would be no need for a resurrection. He can't raise something that hasn't died. This is the bad news for Martha and for Lazarus. Death always comes before resurrection. This is the bad news for you sitting here today. The test always comes before the testimony. The trial comes before the triumph. You will go through things even when you walk close to Jesus. The title of my message today is Resurrection in Me. Some of you have had some tough stuff in your life. Like Martha, maybe you're in a painful season. And some things have died in you. Trust has died in you. Maybe peace has died in you. Hope has died in you. Your vision for tomorrow has died. Maybe even some people here today were raised in church, but your faith has died. I want to tell you today as we look at this story, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Why? Resurrection is around the corner. Victory is around the corner. Breakthrough is around the corner for your life today. He adds this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. See, when Jesus shows up, life shows up. Where Jesus is, death cannot be. See, as a believer, death can make an attempt on you, but it will never get a grip on you. See, where Jesus is, death is defeated. Where Jesus is, life is awakened. Where Jesus is, life is restored. In John 10.10, 10, it says, I have come to give life, and to give life, what? Abundantly. To give life abundantly. See, I've, I've walked with people through all kinds of things, all kind of garbage in their life, death and destruction and health problems. I've walked with believers so, through so many things, and I've seen it over and over and over again in my life. As a believer, you can be surrounded by death, but you can be filled with life. Yeah, if, if that's your testimony, will you say, praise the Lord today? Yeah. Why? The resurrection and the life. Why can you be surrounded by just all this stuff and be filled with life? It goes on to say, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. He's speaking now to Martha about her current situation. The death you are experiencing is about to be met by a miracle. See, I am has now entered the situation. Yahweh has now entered the situation. Friends, your life and your circumstances is never beyond a miracle. Jesus is not limited by your situation or by your problem. And Jesus is speaking to the moment in Martha's life. And today, here at River City Church, Jesus is speaking to the moment in your life. You may feel death is crowding in. You may feel the death of your marriage, the death of that vision, the death of your health, the death of your faith. And he says, but I am here and I am who I am. I am Yahweh. I am deity. I'm not just another man. I am above all. I'm the King of kings. I'm the Lord of lords. And death must bow at the name of Jesus. Addiction must bow at the name of Jesus. Sickness must bow at the name of Jesus. Your hopelessness must bow at the name of Jesus. Friends, your depression that's plaguing you over and over and over again must bow at the name of Jesus. Your anxiety that you've dealt with since you were abused as a child must bow at the name of Jesus. Your shame must bow at the name of Jesus. Wow, that's good news. Can I hear an amen? But then it gets better. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. See, this isn't just for here and now, he tells Martha. You're going to see him come out of that grave. But, but this is an internal thing. See, Lazarus, he may be raised from the dead, but how many of you know Lazarus eventually died? I sure hope so. If he's here today, I'm out of here. <laughs> he eventually died. But there is, Jesus says, hope beyond death. Death is not the end of the story. It is a turning of a new chapter in the life of a believer. It's the reality of heaven. 
Some of you here today, maybe you lost somebody this year. I want you to tell, I want you to hear me today. That was not the end of their story. It's the beginning of a new chapter for them. Even in death, we as believers have victory. We can live with hope now and we can have hope for eternity. And if you're here today and you'd say, I don't know if I died today, I'd even go to heaven. You can know today because of a believer, you're promised heaven and you can walk in the confidence of heaven. No matter the broken state of your life, Friends, hear me, resurrection power wasn't just for 2,000 years ago. It is for today. It is available to you. It is resurrection in you. It's the miracle of Easter available to you. See, on that cross, Jesus, did not, see, Jesus said, it is finished. He did not say, I am finished. See, he came back from the dead, and he rose again, and he brings life to you today. And then it ends. This is a huge question. It says, do you believe this? This is the most important question you will ever be asked. It is the most important answer you will ever give. Do you believe this? I've said it, but do you believe it? For Martha, she believed and it brought life to Lazarus. Jesus goes to that tomb and says, come forth, Lazarus. And and those dry bones come back to life because Jesus is in the business of bringing life to dead things. He's in the business of bringing life to dead people, to dead dreams, to dead hopes, to to dead things in your life today. My great-grandfather was one of the most broken individuals you would ever meet. He was filled with lifelessness. He had no hope. At 12 years old, he wanted to be a sailor. He lived in Sweden, and a Norwegian freight liner pulled up, and and over and over again, he watched these Norwegian freight, freight liners coming in and out of the port. And he said, you know what? I want to be a sailor so bad that I'm not going to wait till I'm older. I'm going to go and I'm going to sneak on a Norwegian freight liner. And so he snuck on the freight liner and he hid under a lifeboat. They took off that day, headed to South America. And three days later, my great-grandfather just couldn't handle being under a lifeboat anymore because he got seasick and he started throwing up as a 12-year-old under there. I get that from him. Don't ever go on a boat with me, okay? Um, I will, I, you don't even want to go there. <laughs> he comes out, and um, they see him. They're shocked to see this little Swedish boy in the, in the ship, and they just had a discussion. What do we do? Do we go back, take him back to Sweden, or do we go to South America? Well, they evaluated, and they had perishable goods on board. They couldn't go back to Sweden. It would wreck all their cargo. So forward they went to South America. And my great-grandfather decided, and the captain decided, if you're going to be on the boat, then you're going to work. And my great-grandfather decided, I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can because I want to earn my keep as a sailor. So he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and he worked, and they got to South America, and then they headed back to Sweden. Months later, they landed in Sweden. They, they went into Sweden, the port in Sweden, and they looked at my great-grandfather, and they were left with a decision. Do we go find his parents, or do we keep him? And they decided that day, let's keep him. He's a good worker. 12 years old. They kept him on that boat. The next 17 years of his life were spent on that Norwegian freight liner. He never went home. They they kept him working, and and they decided this is our little mascot. So as a mascot to a bunch of Norwegian sailors, they taught him to do two things. They taught him to drink, and they taught him to fight. So he would drink and fight and drink and fight, and they'd take him to little ports. And my great-grandfather was a big man. He was over six foot tall. Take him to the ports. They'd get him drunk. They'd have him fight. They'd probably bet money on him and win money and drink and fight and drink and fight. 17 years later, my great-grandfather was a broken man. He writes that he was empty. He felt empty inside. He felt broken inside, and he was headed to San Francisco. And when he got to port in in San Francisco, he decided that he was going to go to his favorite bar. It was on the corner of 3rd and Howard Street. So he headed up to 3rd and Howard, and he did what every good drunk will do on his way to go to the tavern. He had some drinks. And for whatever reason, you got to get drunk before you get drunk, right? So he starts drinking on his way to the tavern. And he gets there, and there's some, some teenagers in front of the tavern, about 30 of them. And they're giving testimonies, and they're doing dramas, and they're singing, and they're doing outreach there on 3rd and Howard in San Francisco. And my great-grandfather sees them. He's got a few drinks in him. And he goes, I'm going to go kick myself some Christian butt today, right? I'm going to go beat up those teenagers, And so he started going towards the teenagers. As he did so, he describes it as this way. It was like lead was poured into his body. And he froze. The Holy Spirit froze him there. 
At the same time that my great-grandfather was frozen in front of the tavern, there was a young boy, just 13 years old, that was with the group, and God spoke to him. He was from, the, the, from Sweden, from the old country, and he just arrived. His name was Sigurd Womark, and God spoke to Sigurd, said, I want you to give your testimony in Swedish. What was my great-grandfather's original language? Swedish. I want you to, the kid said, no way, I'm not doing that. You think I'm crazy? And God said, it kept prompting him, do it, do it, do it. So finally, Sigurd went and he got on top of the crate and he gave his testimony about how Jesus can change your life in Swedish. Well, my great grandfather's out here and he's getting madder and madder and madder. And he's ready to take out that little Swedish boy that just gave his testimony. And um, at the same time, God speaks to Sigurd and says, I want you to go talk to that sailor. And Sigurd said, there's no way I'm going to talk to that sailor. He looks mad, he's greasy, and he's half drunk. I'm not going over there. And God kept dealing with Sigurd, kept dealing with Sigurd. So Sigurd decided, well, I'll go talk to him, but I'm not going to go in front of him. He won't like that. I'm going to go around back of him. So she, he goes, and he heads around the corner and gets him back. And a true story, he goes behind my great-grandfather and pokes him in the ribs and says, God told me to tell you that you're not happy. My great-grandfather there broke on the streets of San Francisco on 3rd and Howard, and on that street corner, he got on his knees and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. I want you to hear me today. I don't care how broken you are. A broken man on a freight liner. Why would God not just give up on that situation? Why wouldn't God say that one's too, all he does is drink and fight. He has no value. I'll go with somebody that's got a good education. I'll go with somebody already together. Why did he not give up? Because God doesn't give up on broken things. I don't care where your life is at today. God does not give up. Well, the time has expired. It's been too. The time never expires for Jesus. It doesn't expire for Jesus. And he is after you. And he's hot on your pursuit. So my great-grandfather stayed in San Francisco. And he goes back to the, that night. He goes back to the, the ship. And, and the, he looked happy. So the, the captain said, what happened to you, Johnson? Did you get married or something? And uh, yeah, my great grandfather, he goes, oh no, I found Jesus. I got saved. And the, the, the captain said, well, if you found Jesus, if you found religion, you got one hour to get off my ship. See, when he got on his knees in San Francisco, he made Jesus savior. But now he had a decision to make, was going to make him Lord of his life. Oftentimes we'll do this. Yes, I believe in you, but we never do the follow-up. So he was in that moment and um, asked that question. And he said, but, but I've been on here 17 years. You're like a dad to me. You guys are my only family. I know no one here. So you got one hour, one hour to get off my ship. He went and grabbed a few things and headed off the ship that day. He had nowhere to go. So he went back to the tavern where the teenagers were. It was two in the morning. And he got to the teenagers and they were still there, still doing drama, still witnessing. And they took him back to the church. He became part of that church, was discipled in that church, became an elder in that church. And he became a carpenter in San Francisco during the boom. Very wealthy, very, very wealthy, very influential carpenter. Had a lot of guys working for him. And one day he's on the job site and God speaks to him and says, Johnson, I want you to go to Brazil as a missionary. My great-grandfather said, absolutely. Dropped his tools and went home to tell my great-grandmother. <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> Goes and tells her. She goes, yes, let's go. So they go to the pastor. They tell the pastor, hey, we're going to go and we're going to be missionaries to Brazil. Pastor said, well, you can't. You've got three kids already. You, you hardly speak English, let alone learn Portuguese. You have never pastored a church. You have no Bible school education. You, there's no way you, we're going to send you. There's no way you can go to Brazil. They were very discouraged. They left that day and they said, well, we're not going to leave it here. Let's go to Springfield, Missouri, to the headquarters of the Assemblies of God, and let's talk to the missions board. So they made an appointment. They went there, laid out their whole vision. The mission board said, we can't send you. You hardly speak English, let alone learn Portuguese. You have three kids already, so you got to make a living. You've never been to Bible school, and you have never pastored a church. You're not qualified. We can't send you. They thanked him and started to walk away. And um, as they were walking away, the head of the mission board said, can I ask you a question? Um, what are you guys going to do now? Well, my great-grandmother, who was Norwegian, turned around with a Norwegian look, said, oh, we're going to Brazil. <laughs> we're going to Brazil. So they left, they sold everything they had, figured they could live in Brazil 10 years. My great-grandfather had been kicked out of Brazil 22 times for fighting and drinking. Every time they ported there, he would get in a fight. Every time he'd get arrested and sent back to the ship. As he's pulling into Brazil after a month on a ship, they're getting there. And my, my great-uncle, Bernard Johnson Jr., looks at him and says, and, and he sees his dad's crying. And he says, Dad, why are you crying? I, think, I thought you wanted this. And my, my great-grandfather said, I, I do. 
but 22 times I've been kicked out of Brazil for drinking, for fighting, and this time I go back as a man of God sent to spread the gospel to this nation. They landed in Brazil. During my great-grandfather's time, you see that right there, there's their missions card and picture of my great-grandfather. During their time in Brazil, they made a huge impact. He opened 100 cities. By the way, the sympathy of God came back two years later and ordained him in Brazil. They found him, hunted him down, and ordained him. And I am fourth generation of sympathy of God minister after him. He opened 100 villages and cities. Worship team, you can come on up to the, to the gospel. During his time there, he laid hands on and ordained 400 men as pastors. He built with his own hands 36 churches in Brazil. He made a huge difference in Brazil. That, that Swedish sailor that God could have easily given up on. But God said, I don't give up on people. I'm in the business of bringing life to broken places. The only question is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe that God can do this? In 2010, the month before I took this church as the pastor, I went to Brazil and um, I went and spoke to some of my great-grandfather's churches. And my grandfather's churches, he was also a missionary there. And I, I did this. And then we had a missions parade. They said, we're going to do a big mission service. Before that, we're going to have a missions parade. And we want you to lead the parade. And so we started the parade with just a few people. If you'll hit that next picture for me. That's the end of the day with the parade there. I'm the good-looking guy with the red tie on in the front, okay? <laughs> Thousands of people all impacted generations ago because God did not give up on a broken, hurting person in a Norwegian freight liner in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. He said, I see you there. I see you there, and I have not given up on you. Will you stand with me today? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. The question is, do you believe this? Do you believe this for your life? It's easy to believe it for someone else's life, but it's harder to believe it for your own mess. For everyone went bow your head and close your eyes. I'm the resurrection of life. I bring life to a broken thing. Do you believe this? Some of you, you may be like my great-grandfather who was in church as a little boy but strayed a long ways away you've strayed far from god you don't know today that you'd even have eternal life with him you can have that today the bible says to believe in your heart so right now just between you and god say that's me that's me god I, i'm lost like that norwegian sailor i'm lost and i need you jesus then the bible says to confess with your mouth with every eye closed and head bowed. If you'd say that to me, will you lift your hand and keep it up? I just want to pray for you. Keep it up, okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Come on, anyone else, don't miss this moment. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? That's eight. Is there a ninth person here? Is there one more? We thank you, Jesus, for life today. We thank you for life. For those that raise their hand, Lord, I pray, God, that you'd give them new life today. That you give them new life, that they would feel the love of God, that they'd feel that new creation in their spirits. In the name of Jesus. The last thing today, there's some of you, you're like Martha, you're walking through life through a trial, through tribulation, through pain, and you just need, you need Jesus to do what Jesus does, to bring you peace and strength in the journey you're on. If that's you, will you just lift your hand? I don't give peace to anybody. Just lift your hand. We do that to say yes to God. I don't give peace. I don't give joy to anyone. I can't do that, but the Holy Spirit can. And as you lift your hands today, he wants to pour out peace upon you. He wants to pour out joy upon you. He wants to pour out hope upon you sitting here today where you felt hopeless. He wants to pour out hope to you. He wants to break things in your life. He'll break depression. He'll break your anxiety. He'll break that fear. He wants to bring freedom to your life today. I pray, God, you would bring life to dry bones. You'd bring life to lifeless places in the name of Jesus. Church, this afternoon, we're going to sing a new song, and it's called Rattle. This song's about the sound of those dry bones rattling. And I believe that the dry bones of your life, they're rattling right now. The Lord wants to bring them back to life.
So I just encourage you today to just press in. morning. I don't know about you, but I, I just can't stop crying today. My eyes keep getting teared up and it's because I know the resurrection power of the Lord and what it's done and the dry bones that he brought to life. And so this morning, if you're here and I know, I know personally that there's someone here right now that's dealing with something that seems impossible. I want you to shout it out. I want you to declare don't you dare leave this place without submitting the things that you're dealing with at the foot of the cross. And maybe you don't know God. Maybe you've never had a relationship with him. I just encourage you this morning. 
I just encourage you this morning to take those things that you're dealing with and give them to God. Take that leap of faith. Because our God can do the impossible. Our God can restore broken things. Our God can heal. And our God can deliver. And all you got to do is declare it out of faith. Come on, we sing it out. Say, my God. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that he... Come on, my God. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore. Come on, take a leap of faith this morning. My God. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore it. Come on, if you believe it this morning, sing out, my God. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore it. Be that he was just as, just as the brother of Mary, brother of Martha, if there's any. Maybe you don't believe. And I just encourage you to take that leap of faith right now. Give God an opportunity. I know that there's people in here right now ready to give up, but he will never give up on you. You, you hear that, Jamie?
on, give him a shout of praise this morning. Yeah. Woo. For a moment, just think about when he spoke to your bones and said, live. Woo. Oh, man, I'm telling you, God is on the move. The last couple weeks, we've, we've been on high school campuses and junior high campuses and we're at uh, two of them this last week. Over 130 kids came out. Like 90 gave their lives to the Lord. Yeah. And there was, we were at one of the high schools, and during second lunch, we were walking the kids through the prayer of salvation, and you could just, uh, many of them were just bawling their eyes out. Just God was doing so much, and I really felt like the weight of their burdens were being lifted. And so this morning, if you feel like you are walking with weights of burden, let's get free this morning. If that's you, if you're like, hey, you know what? If I'm being honest this morning, I'm, I'm carrying around some weight of burden. If that's you, just lift a hand up, lift two hands up. Yep, right, Father, right now, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, that when we're yoked with you, when we're yoked with Jesus, you do all the heavy lifting. So right now, God, we release it to you Lord, we thank you that you are a good God. You are a good God. You are a good God. And I thank you that no matter what circumstances happen in our life, that doesn't dictate your goodness. Lord, I pray this week that we would, that we would um, live out this resurrection in our life, Lord God. That the resurrection in me would be prevalent. And that this world would see it. We love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Hey, I want to give you some, uh, yeah, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you some quick instructions. You, you can be seated just for one moment. We are a very uh, missions-focused church. We really believe in, in missions, and we give to missions, and we send missionaries. And um, this summer, we have a team of 30 people going to Mexico, and we're going to uh, build two houses this summer. And so, um, so real quick, let's uh, watch, a, watch a quick video on that. Good morning and happy Easter River City Community Church. My name's Jeff and I run an organization called You Reach and we're here coming to you from the Baja Peninsula where we're dedicating a house. Now this is actually the 125th house that we've built and dedicated in the last 15 years and several of those were built by your church, River City. And we're so excited to have you as a part of that this summer. Here we're building for people that are the working poor, mostly single moms, who would never have a chance at home ownership on their own. But a church like yours comes in and changes the trajectory of their life economically, spiritually, and otherwise. So when you come, you really make a change. The message of the gospel is this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the idea that your church gets an opportunity to show unconditional love to somebody you haven't even met yet, to me, that's the gospel. That's Easter. So thank you so much for your dedication and for what you're doing and for coming this summer and showing God's grace to somebody who you don't even know yet. God bless you. So, you know, with missions, you can go or give, or both, and so this morning, we're asking that um, between uh, all of our services that we get uh, $6,000 to help fund the houses, so um, it, that's the cost to build two houses out there. Um, if, if you feel compelled to give, if you feel like the Lord is speaking you to give, uh, we do have our giving center back there. You can uh, jump on our website, rccg.church, or scan the card in back of your chair and uh, find out how to give through text and all that stuff, but um, we are so glad that you guys decided to spend Easter Sunday morning with us. Thank you guys so much. Let me, let me pray for you. We also have white buckets that our ushers will have. If you have any loose cash that you'd like to uh, donate for the Mexico missions trip, um, please, uh, please do that. So, Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you for this, for this day, Lord. What, what an incredible service. What, what an incredible presence of, of, of God that we felt today, Lord. We are so thankful that you are not absent from your people. Lord, that you're not disconnected from us. Lord, we love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Don't feel like you have to rush off. Uh, feel free to meet someone you don't know. Uh, yeah, hang out, hang out. We, we, we want to meet you guys.